Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar sponsored by Lanteria.com and uh, our HR software product, Lanteria. I'm Karen Smith. We're going to be talking today. Uh, it's kind of this is a follow up presentation to one I did late last year. Um, the one I did late last year was uh, driven more for IT professionals uh, or even HR professionals who might be planning the implementation. They purchased an HRMS, our product or some product, and they needed some guidelines on how to create a plan, activities, tasks, considerations, stakeholders, all those typical project related activities and items. Today's it's going to be a follow up, and this is going to talk more to the data, the components, the artifacts that either the business team, meaning HR, finance, talent management, talent development, would have to collect if they already exist in the environment or create if they have not thought or had this available to them in the past. And so we're going to do this follow on presentation. I'm going to take you through some of the core modules in Lantaria. We're going to talk about some of the preparatory items that you need to, again, either find or create or make some decisions about um, for each of those modules. And I'm going to talk directly to those items today. So as I mentioned, I'm Karen Smith. I've been working with Lantaria for the last uh, it's coming up on six years. I can't believe it's gone by really quickly. Um, I'm an old school IT person, as you can see, I have a number of years experience, but um, working in this space, you constantly have to keep fresh of new functionality and new opportunities that we have inside of uh, our application. Um, I've spent a good portion of my career in the HR space supporting uh, talent management and employee development teams, as well as uh, core HR practices and procedures. So usually I can speak to that pretty well across all of our modules. I'll tell you a little bit about our company. It's founded in 2006, so we're coming up again over um, quite a number of years in experience. We have over 200,000 plus users and that is globally. Um, uh, we have partners in some of uh, the countries in the globe, uh, such as Australia that we work with, but we also support directly ourselves, uh, implementation and selling of our product. And you'll see in our company list of some of the top names that we've worked with. Whoops, hang on, come on little slide. Oh, maybe that's the next slide. Here, let's do this. I'll show you our clients first, then we'll go back. Uh, so as you can see, again, some major name players. We obviously couldn't include everybody. I have some great clients here in the United States and I know my counterparts have fabulous ones in Europe as well. Um, we'd love to again, acknowledge everybody that's purchased our product and uses it today uh, because uh, we really appreciate their support. And um, we love the feedback that they give us about our product and also uh, things that we can bring to the table to enhance the experience for them as well. You can see also that we have uh, won a number of awards. These are some of the most current ones that we have uh, for being a, um, a kind of a leader in our space. And uh, we are a somewhat of a unique application in the sense that we do sit on top of the SharePoint platform. So uh, definitely in that Microsoft space, if you are a dedicated Microsoft house, meaning you use all of their products and tools, um, and also a high performance or uh, high performer award um, earned that earlier this year. Talking a little bit about our product, um, again, we're one of the leading developers for having an HRMS on top of a SharePoint uh, foundation. Um, we offer not only HR and resource management, essentially records management of your employees, but we also offer performance solution for appraisal and assessments. We also do learning management, be that self in-house created content, as well as plugging in um, third party vendors that would offer solutions for you. Uh, we definitely have a mature product at this point, and it uh, does offer a lot of functionality. And you have to kind of think in that term of that seamless uh, SharePoint integration, 
we are able to, uh, with SharePoint, extend it quite a bit uh, through development. So oftentimes, if you don't see the functionality that you need or you want exactly working the way with the product out of the box, we can expand that through custom development. And um, that's usually relatively low cost because again, it's a, a very standardized platform and um, there's not a need for anything specialty wise. It's a, a lot of the work can be done in uh, standard uh, code languages. We're also a gold partner and preferred business app with Microsoft. So that's our partnership with them. And we currently work on these SharePoint platforms, um, which is going all the way back to 2013 and all the way on up to uh, 2019 with the Office 365 authentication integration. We do not work with SharePoint online. Um, and the reason being is that it's actually a completely different animal than SharePoint uh, premise is what I would call it. Or, you know, again, it could be premise or hosted, but um, there are two versions of SharePoint. And I know um, Microsoft likes SharePoint Online. It is very easy to use. It's a great solution for building like an intranet or something uh, internally, but uh, not always, uh, doesn't have, carry all the same functionality, uh, isn't available on that platform as it is on the like 2019 version. So that's just an FYI. So why we don't have that. All right, hopefully, uh, while I was going through all that fun intro piece, um, most folks have joined, so I'm going to hop into the core of the presentation. Um, the first one is preparation. So that's always a good one to start with. You've bought this new HRIS, HRMS. You take your back high, which acronym you would choose to use. And what do you do? Well, last time when we talked, we talked about an implementation guide. Again, that's coming from the IT side of my brain. What are the things that I have to get together as a project manager? Uh, and what do I have to, who do I have to bring to the table? What do I have to design in terms of a project plan? How am I setting dates, schedules? How long do things take? What activities and so on? This time we're going to talk, as I mentioned, uh, more about what do I have to go get? And, and I'll say from my experience, when I work with a new client, this is often one of the more um, can be challenging questions because honestly, it depends on where you're starting from. If some of our clients uh, kept all of their records in Excel or they or Word or on paper, uh, then, um, and that is very viable, um, a lot of times they don't have anything more defined than that. And uh, suddenly now they're looking at other modules and these modules have uh, functionality in it that uh, they want to take advantage of, but they just haven't considered um, some of the elements that they have to, again, create or go and collect in order to uh, implement it. So let's take a peek. The three key, key questions that I um, have set for today, we're going to answer these for each of the standard modules that we offer in our application. So when you buy an HRMS, it doesn't matter if it's SAP or PeopleSoft or Workday or us, um, oftentimes they all offer some of the same standard components. Typically there's one for talent management, that's AKA recruiting. There's one for performance and appraisals. There's a, could be a learning management component. Um, there's obviously the core records management piece and oftentimes there's an absence uh, module as well. That we have some additional ones. We have a succession module. We have a compensation module. Um, and I won't necessarily talk to some of the, I, they're not necessarily subsets, but there isn't a lot of detail. I'll touch on some of them in here because they are associated. Compensation is usually associated with records for employee record management and succession goes along with performance. But um, I'm going to try to stay to some of the key modules so that we're not on a webinar all day because I could go on for a long time. But uh, the key questions again are focused on those core modules and Again, these are looking from our perspective, but they can be practiced and used. The same method could be used with someone else's product. So while we would love for you again to purchase our product, we understand that we do have competition. And sometimes uh, people are just trying to understand what it is that they would need to get and do um, to implement this, any of these products. Okay. 
So the three key questions, what does this component accomplish? So again, what does the module do? What, what's the point of the module? And I'll touch on those briefly. I think some of them, again, are pretty obviously named and I don't need to tell you all about uh, what it is, but I will reference it as it relates to the next two questions, which is what's the source of the information, meaning does it need data to drive it and where does that information come from? And then what do I need to define this component? So do I have to build something because I don't have a form? Do I need to create a workflow because I don't have one? Or do I have those things and I just need to translate them from either the current system or current process that I do today and figure out how they work over in the other system, the new system, okay? So we'll go through these. You'll see these questions pop up again. And I also wanted to make mention that uh, we now have this, what we call the Getting Started Guide. Uh, this guide will be published up on under our um, resources section on lanteria.com. And you'll be able to uh, download a copy of it. It's in uh, PDF form. And you will see a lot of the same items that I touch on here today. I was looking at this guide when we were working on it and we actually built in some checklists that again would allow you to go along and say I got this I got to go create this and when I say create it means I might need a group to decide what the process is it goes from A to B to C to D and we have to get everybody's buy-in it could mean we as an HR team need to go off and decide how this is going to work how is it going to look you know those kinds of things and um Again, it's to help so that you're not just staring into the abyss going, where do I start? And so hence the getting started board. So uh, again, this will be available. You'll be able to get to this. Um, if you can't find it, just you can always email me and I'll be happy to uh, send you off a copy as well. All right. So one other reminder here as we start get into this detail is the staff that you need when you're doing these types of implementation projects. You need to make sure that you understand everybody who potentially could contribute. Nobody likes to work in a vacuum, make decisions, um, and then ultimately you have to go to somebody and say, okay, I need you to do X, Y, and Z. And they say, that's not how I do it. I do it ABC. And then you're left with you built something and it doesn't work the way it should. Um, so testing becomes really important. Buy-in becomes really important from other people. And that includes people who are doing the process, the security team, IT team, HR team, talent team. Um, obviously you need leadership to understand what it is that you're trying to achieve and then also meet if they have needs or vision that they were had regarding this product and project. And then obviously the employees. You want the employees to be encouraged to use the system. We don't, we're not out to scare anybody. Sometimes people get frightened when they have, suddenly have a performance management system. Um, some people just get nervous about things like that, it's change. Uh, but you want buy-in from the employees, you want them to understand, um, we're not trying to make this difficult, we wanna make it effective, um, you know, consistent, which is great because a lot of times people don't get consistent behavior uh, and that's gonna afford them some things that they didn't have in the past. Uh, plus, you know, they'll be able to contact maybe HR directly about very specific things, they haven't been able to do that in the past or as it relates to they haven't had, um, oh, you know, documentation about things either. You know, somebody can come by and just say, hey, you did a great job. Here's your here's your salary change. I've, I've worked in places like that. And nobody really told you you're doing good, bad. You need more training, um, those kinds of things, which now a performance management system could easily do. Uh, you also want to always work with those contributors. That's typically the IT team. They're your technical resources. They're the funds that might be uh, managing the environment if it's hosted in-house or indoor, handling user account, maybe even some data. And then also any third-party vendors that you may engage with for recruiting or learning. Uh, again, we'll touch on all those. But you want to make sure that you take into consideration before you start any project of this size and think about all the people that you either use today or you might want to go and get um, some resources from. 
All right. So data driven, that's the first piece of any of these implementation, especially records management, uh, HR records management systems is data. So typically, almost every client I have has the data somewhere. It may be in an Excel worksheet. It may be in a SQL or access database, or maybe it's even in SharePoint. But that data is somewhere. Even again, also external source could be in a finance system, an ERP or payroll system, ADP, Great Plains, Trinet. Um, most everybody usually has one of those. They need to find a way to pay people. So they bring up that system first and foremost. And that data about that person, name, birth date, social security, those kinds of key data pieces plus personal contact information is usually kept somewhere. And the first piece you need for any type of HRMS implementation is finding that data and getting that data. And I think uh, what's unfortunate is this is again where you have to bring in the right folks into your team. HR teams go, I don't know where it is. It's, we store it and we'll say ADP. But they're not technical enough to know how to either export it out of there or how to get it out of there, but their IT team does. So again, you got to make sure you get those right resources. If IT is driving the project, they're going to know where it is. Uh, HR is not. So maybe it's their responsibility to get this data. But ultimately, we need the data. And whether we make it automated, meaning it's coming from that source and directly populating Lantaria, or you are exporting it, and then populating Lantaria um, to go forward with that system. Uh, either way, still need the data. So it's good to know where the data is originating from. And then any of those integrations, as I noted, whether they be automated or otherwise, um, who are you working with? So you'll notice here it also says job target, zip recruiter. That's for recruiting. It's a way for the data in Lantaria to go out to um, a vendor who will uh, publicize your job openings across many job boards. Um, predictive index, that's a site where you kind of take, I will, uh, I'll call it a skills or personality skills assessment. And then that can come into Landshare. We have an integration with that. Go one, LinkedIn learning, those are our learning management integration. So Thinking ahead, do I need a third party vendor? Do I already have an account with LinkedIn Learning? Do I already have an account with ZipRecruiter? Do we already have an account with ADP? Um, we have those built in um, for integrations available for people to use right out of the box. So if that's the case, then you can kind of put those on your checklist and say, these are the things that I need to be uh, considerate of and make sure that we go forward and have them on our list somewhere so that when it comes to that part in the implementation, that module, um, we're prepared and we know what we need to go ask. The other thing to consider here uh, as part of the data is what role will everyone play inside the system? And so typically everybody comes into our system as an employee, that's just a given. And then if um, an employee has other employees reporting to them, they also get placed in the manager permission role. Then there's HR, which is, they assume somewhat of a super admin capability over the system, at least for our system. But again, that's typically the case. They are able to create things, delete things, make new things, report on data. Uh, not everybody has that same functionality. Uh, obviously, a manager has some functionality there. Typically, no one but HR can ever delete anything. And even then, we're cautious about what HR can delete. Um, and then employees are really just participants. But you can also have, in our case, a, what's called a local HR. This is a way to decentralize HR functionality. Again, they can create some things. They have some control. Typically, they cannot delete. But um, they can manage a area, department, location, company, 
Uh, that's essentially how you would decentralize them by. We have some other roles inside the system in our case that are training manager, we have a recruiting manager, we have a performance manager. So if there are some separation in folks that have certain roles and they may have oversight on a particular module, like a performance review creator, uh, they can also have those unique roles, which allow them access to create and operate the module. Uh, in addition to, may say, being a man, just a regular employee. But they have to take on, they have to move into that role, switch roles, so they can get that functionality. But they are still very limited in terms of what they can see about employees. The key here is that HR really is the only team that can see all of the key information about any employee. And for security purposes, that's kind of the way we want it. So again, another decision point here, you have to decide uh, managers is kind of maybe not such a decision, but who's going to be in the HR group who might have training manager permissions, who might be local HR, you would have to make some decisions about user roles and, and who, if, and sometimes people even create unique new permission groups that are specific, um, that take away some of the privileges, but give others, uh, you can do that as well within SharePoint. But these are the ones typically out of the box that you'll see from us. All right, so the base to build everything on is Core HR. We call it our module Core HR. Others call it uh, foundation. I oftentimes refer to Core HR as foundation. It's a the key piece behind this component is the organization and management of the employee data. That's its first and foremost role in the system. And you need to have this before you can even move into any of the other modules. Uh, it's critical to know we have all the right information about the employees put into the system. And that includes organizational structure. So that means pretty much department or division hierarchy, you're building a org chart essentially by having different departments, divisions, teams, business units, whatever you want to call them uh, in a pyramid form. And you're going to show that relationship. You're going to build that into the system. And then you're going to put job roles into the system. That's another key piece. And then you're going to put people into the job roles. So it's kind of like the house of Jack built. The people go into the job roles, the job roles go into the org units and and or uh, and you can then go companies and countries or locations. Uh, all that has to be defined. That has to get back again to the data. Where does that data originally come from? And that data will help decide and drive how this now looks inside a relational database. Some of the other things that you can do in this module is standardize processes for onboarding, offboarding, or any other types of task-related activities. I've built exit surveys in, um, in a standardized process here. Um, we've seen some of our clients have ones for transferring employees, um, promoting employees. There are related tasks that different people in different groups have to do or have to fill out a form uh, or gain approval. So there's also uh, approval requests that are built here. And there's also probation reviews. And probation reviews, though, it takes advantage of some of the concepts of our performance module, it does not require the performance module. So with our application, you don't have to buy all of the modules. Um, it's certainly probably priced for you to be able to price better for you to buy all of them. And then you use the ones that you want, but you could just buy core HR. That's a given you have to have that one because you need the data. And then maybe you buy performance or you buy just recruiting. And uh, so probation reviews is in here. Again, it's an activity that's based on people as they're hired into the organization as to whether they stay or they're not the right fit. And that can be usually over a um, 30 day, 90 day, 60 day, 120 day um, type period. And then you can typically make a decision. So this functionality exists here in Core HR for that reason, because you have the 
entrance and exit potentially of employees. And again, as you can see, the standardized processes for onboarding and offboarding are also here. So they're kind of companion components. So that's what we're trying to accomplish in this initial data module. And like I said, it can be called a lot of different things. We happen to call ours core HR. And then we're going to find out what's the source of that information. So it can be manually entered. We don't necessarily recommend that if you have a lot of employees, <clears throat> excuse me, um, initially anyway. Uh, or it can be uh, automated integration coming from another source like ADP. So every, you do your work in ADP, you put somebody on the payroll, you create a new record for them, and every night um, there is data that is sent to Lanteria, creates a record in Lanteria, sends over the data that you want to stand up that record for the person like date of hire, department, job, you know, puts in a start date for them, potentially could put even a salary in there for them. Um, and that is just done hands off. It's just automated. So you're only really working in ADP for changing up people, adding new people, um, terminating people, or it's going to change and get pushed down as well. Uh, or you're doing a manual input. And a manual input could be, it starts off as we do an import of all the data. We'll say your data was in Excel. You're going to give us some worksheets. We're going to import everybody that you have active to date, put them in the system, and then going forward, you're going to manually create a record every time a new person joins the company. Now, some of our smaller firms typically do this. They don't have, uh, they don't, maybe they don't use an ADP or they just don't want that an automated in integration. So this is, how they manage by adding those entries uh, manually. So that's understanding how. So if you decide for an automated integration, remember we have to go back and look at that data-driven point that says, oh, I got a third-party vendor and I got to put a note here that I have to go find out from the third-party vendor, uh, whether or not I can get to my data, whether what data can I have access to, because some vendors have different uh, buy-in scales and sometimes they don't let you export your data without moving to the next tier or they they only limit you know let you have three fields to come out um, without ask you know without, again without paying more money to them to allow you the luxury to have your data <laughs> come out of the system um, that's would be again an investigative item that you would need to go and work with that vendor. And then here's some of the things that you need to define and maybe make decisions on. Now you may have a company organizational structure today, but maybe you want to show one a little differently. I have clients that oftentimes they may have a very complex org structure in their company today, but when they move to Lantaria, because they're, they already have another system where some of that is tracked, they just need a, a bare bones one and everybody is just in a couple of silos. Um, and, it, and it's not quite the same pyramid that it might be uh, within the company directly. Um, but if you have to decide, you would have to plan and have a discussion about how is this information going to look. Uh, same with employee data. We give you the option to show an employee card essentially for each employee. You have a number of fields of data, as I mentioned before, name, address, job title, org group or department that you're with, data hire, service date, you know, kind of the, all the good classics if you're an HR person, all the stuff that you have to track you can decide what gets displayed on that card and you can custom configure that so that you can see what you need to see. You also can allow other people to see certain data. So say an employee can see their base general information, um, but you know they're restricted from seeing maybe employment data, uh, they just, they already know what date they were typically hired, but if there's any other dates that they have in there, probation dates, review dates, um, EEO data, some of this stuff just isn't necessary to show to all of the different roles. So this again ties back to those, what role are they in? Managers might want, will see more of employee data um, and they will only see their own employees. They won't see everybody in the company, that kind of thing. 
So this is where this starts to, you need to get an understanding of what do you want to show? What do you want to report on? Um, how do those things look? The other piece, and typically this is not that challenging once people get a sense of once the data gets in the system, they, they can visually see it. And oftentimes that's one of the biggest hurdles is people, once they see it, they kind of go, oh, okay, I get it. I need, I understand. I don't need that field that can be hidden. Take that one away, move it around. I want a different section, that kind of thing. But the standardized processes and reporting sometimes can throw people for a loop. Um, maybe they already have some reports that they do today or wish they could do today. Uh, that's what's going to be key. You want to bring that forward to say, hey, I have this report and I'd like to do it this way or I, I need this report because somebody asked me for all this all the time and I have to go and collect it from multiple sources and it takes me forever. Is it possible to just have a report that maybe lists all the employees um, by department or by who they report to or something to that effect or how they roll up through the organization? Um, again, so think about the reports that you might want to need. Again, go off and get samples of what you've got or what you might like. Standardized processes, again, this can be something brand new to many people. They can look at it and go, well, when somebody comes in the door, we do X, Y, Z, and but we'd like to do more steps. And we have other people that we'd like to be involved. And again, this functionality is specific to assigning tasks. It's for HR to reduce the amount of time they spend on follow-up. But you, as like an IT person or a security person or finance person, would get a task. It would be assigned to you. You'd be notified of that task. And then once you finish that task, you can mark it complete. And HR can look at the tasks that are pending for this, we'll say, new hire. And they can get a good sense of who's done what, who hasn't done something, maybe because they were on vacation or they didn't see the notifications or they're behind. And then they can go have a more direct conversation with somebody to say, hey, I see that you're still waiting or I'm still waiting on you to finish this piece. Why? You know, what's the issue? Is there something I can help with? That kind of thing. But standardized processes, think about, come prepared. Either you have to create it if you don't have it, but come prepared for what are the activities for onboarding? What are the activities for offboarding? Are there things uh, separately that you do for exiting employees? Like I said, I've built exit processes, which give kind of a survey form back to the employee that's leaving that they have to complete. And then that information goes to a report and the teams can review um, what their survey results were. And you can see maybe if there's an issue starting somewhere, uh, people don't, I don't, know, don't like something that may be happening in the company or, you know, it had nothing to do with that. They're just moving out of state. But again, this is key data that typically uh, you might get in an exit interview, but you don't get it in writing. You just you know, have somebody take some notes about it. Uh, this would allow those employees' perspective to be recorded. And like I said, you can then report on it and report back if you had, hopefully not, but it may be at a mass exodus and you wanna know why all these people left. Okay. Sorry, it, uh, as we noted earlier, it, uh, before we started as we were talking, sidebar and uh, it's allergy season so try not to cough in your ear so that is again where's the data coming from what do i need to collect and here is some of the checklist items that are in our guide so you would need a list of current employees with that supporting information departments countries locations play types statuses all this stuff has to be considered and whether or not you have it or you want to have it in the system, it is still your choice. Don't make it feel like you have to have it, but these are just reminders of like, oh, I need to provide this. If, if you want a really robust, fully functional system when you start using our product or any product like ours, uh, you want to be able to have 
a lot of information put into the system. And this module is the key place to do that um, because it will feed all the other modules that uh, interconnect here. Okay. So let's move on to another module. Here's one, uh, this one is performance and performance is all about you know providing a tool to regularly review employee performance um, you can put it against standardized rating scales meaning people get scored uh, they may have uh, standardized responsibilities standardized demonstrated competencies um, personal goals company goals department goals uh, any of those things uh, that typically a person is expected to do in the job role they're hired for can now be put into a performance review process and form and uh, you can determine merit increases um, training opportunities improvement plans whatever it needs to be uh, this helps you manage your people okay and it hopefully gives them the proper feedback uh, that they're expecting. There's no surprises because oftentimes um, companies who don't use the standardized process will find that uh, it can come as a surprise when they suddenly say to somebody, hey, you're not pulling your weight. And that person goes, I didn't have any clue. One of the other things that we offer is a feedback um, component here, um, some functionality, not only for employees, um, to provide feedback for their peers um, and or people that they've worked on a specific or side project with, but also for managers to give feedback directly to their employees by meeting with them on a regular basis. We have seen the trend that many companies have started to move away from very standardized forms and they've moved to this opportunity where they set an agenda, they have topics they talk about, and every two months they meet with their employees and it's a very continual ongoing conversation. If the employee wants to talk about something, they add it to the agenda. The manager wants to talk about something, they add it to the agenda. When they meet, they find new things, they add those to the agenda. And the agenda can continually run in perpetuity as things come on and be finished and add new things and so on. So. Everybody understands where everybody is. There's a record of what was discussed um, based upon the notes that were keyed in. And uh, the employee can always go back and refer and say, oh, I'm still supposed to take some training that he recommended, my boss recommended to me. I see it on my list. And so I've got to go enroll in something. Uh, so again, it's, it's a very uh, fluid and active form versus the more traditional where, you know, annually we run a review process and everybody participates in that so two different approaches so that's what this module is all about and what are your considerations so the source of the information again goes back to what do you have in place today if you have anything if you're brand new and you've never had a performance uh, viable performance system in your company prior then you're going to start from scratch and you're going to have to look at the artifacts of what you need to build. If you do have something, uh, meaning you used, again, an Excel worksheet or a Word document, because um, obviously both of those tools are very advanced and you can make forms in both of those, but nonetheless, um, usually kind of one dimensional and you're not able to uh, have some relational information like you'll see what we're able to show and do in our system. But again, you'd have to think about what's what's those practices that you have? What are the what does the company need? Do you need to ensure that everybody has at least one review a year? Or do you, does the company need more active uh, feedback? And we've seen uh, a couple of different companies that we've deployed to recently, uh, they kind of go in two different directions. One was very traditional and a very standardized annual process. Uh, the other one was more fluid and wanted more consistent feedback and partly was because of the way uh, the business they were in and how they did business. The second one that needed the more fluid one was a consulting company. And as a result, they 
would put people on project teams. They'd go work for a client three months, six months, whatever. They'd come off the project. They'd get feedback. And then they'd go off on another one month, two months. So every time they came back from the end of a project, they would meet with their manager and get feedback. And that would also include collecting feedback from the people that they worked with on that project team because they were constantly being interchangeable with all of the teams across, you know, if you're a business analyst, you're going to be assigned here and there, project manager, same kind of thing. So what does your company need? You need to think about that. What do you need? And again, I want to stress that HR may not have the answer for this. They may need to go to the executive management to say, what do you want? What is it that's going to be effective? Sometimes when you're starting and implementing a new system and you've never done it before, less is best. Don't overcomplicate it. Even if somebody asks you to do it, think about it. You can always add to it. It's harder to take away and it's harder to regain the, oh, I don't know, the uh, trust kind of of the employees. Uh, if you've made it very difficult for them and very overwhelming initially, uh, a lot of times people don't like the experience or unhappy. And it really has nothing to do with the tool and or the way it was deployed. It just, again, was overwhelming. So you need to have an idea of company, uh, just kind of the sense of the company, um, the personality of the company, what the culture is there, and understand that you know, what's going to make sense there. Also, rule adherence. Uh, some folks have to have this uh, for gov government purposes. We have people that are outside the United States, and oftentimes uh, governments are enforcing some of their decisions. You'll see that in some of our other modules as well, uh, where they just have to do it a certain way, and or they're, uh, they don't necessarily as a company get to decide. Somebody else makes a decision of maybe labor laws or something to that effect. So again, you have to think about what's going to work for you. And then to define the component, uh, you're going to need a review form. So these are, again, usually the, the definition or the artifacts are tangible things you can hold in your hand or at least show on paper. So a re review form template, and that could be, there's an annual review form, there's a mid-year review form, there's a project review form, there's a 360 review form, and you can go on and on. You can make up ones um, if you want to, but those are some of the standard ones. And in our case, there are workflows that are associated with every one of those templates. So it starts by going to the employee, then to the manager, then to maybe another uh, senior executive back to that manager, meets with the employee, he signs off, sends the employee, they sign off, goes to HR for review. I think you get my drift. Uh, you need to know what the path is. Who needs to participate? And again, that's something that you're going to have to define if you haven't already done so. Or maybe you have to change it based upon now what you're capabilities are. Maybe you had it a certain way because that was um, the only opportunity you had to make it work. Now you're going to have an opportunity to maybe automate it and do it a little bit differently. And then the defined competencies. This is always a difficult one for people suddenly. I've had two different, probably two or three different experiences here, but I have, I've had clients dive in and they're defining every competency. And again, a competency would be a displayed skill such as written communication, customer service, team player. That can be all demonstrated skills. And then you're scored on those things. Uh, they also can vary by your job role. So some leadership roles would have leadership competencies. If you're professional within the company, then maybe you don't have those. Maybe you do, maybe you're a supervisor or so on. But again, you can make some separation between the two. And defining as many as possible is an also very recommended if this is your new uh, or first time into using competencies. It can be a lot of work. There's a lot of maintenance. You have to put all that information in the system. So I have seen clients dial that back to core values core demonstrated company values and whether or not you demonstrate those. Um, again, team player, um, uh, you're, you have honesty, 
you know, you're a good performer, that kind of thing. You can, you can pick like 10 and everybody gets those. And then maybe leadership gets some extra ones and you can go from there. Same with goals. You can have a lot of goals. You can start with the company goals that are then go down to department goals that feed the company goals. And then you can have individual goals as contributors to the department goals that contributed to the company goals. It's a whole hierarchy structure you can build, but is that the best place for you to start? So do you require goals for employees? Do you you know, everybody has to have four um, every year. Everybody has to have uh, two, three, one. What, you know, what do they have to have if they have to have any? And are you going to score them on those? Are they worth uh, a rating scale? Um, same with skills. Do you, you know, you can set up uh, skills that any employee can have, but some may be specific to say, if I'm a programmer, I have to know certain languages. I may need certain certifications. If I work in a warehouse, uh, you can add those and you can see what that person has in terms of skills. And you can see where the gaps are. And when you see the gaps, then you can target training or learning development toward those. So again, that's kind of the key here in performance. You're trying to assess the person, understand what they're capable of, look for the gaps, train for the gaps, or uh, they have to do work service, journeyman, apprenticeship, whatever, to gain more knowledge and experience. And then you can reevaluate them and determine and just keep on doing that as they move through the organization and they grow with their career at the company. So here's some artifacts. As I noted, there's those performance review form samples. These forums can have all kinds of stuff. They can have open text boxes. They can have rating scales where they pick their um, level of knowledge or experience about something. Um, if you use some of the built-in functionality, you can have goals. You could be scored about uh, scored against goals, completion of goals. You can be scored for competencies. You can list job requirements so they understand <clears throat> what's expected of them for their job, any of those things. 360 feedback, those can be key questions that you're building into a form. Project forms, um, again, can be specific to if you worked on a project and after you come out, um, what's the evaluation on you on how you worked on that project? If you were a project manager, business analyst, whatever you were, programmer. Probation reviews also can come in here. You can make them more elaborate than what's in our first module. So they too can uh, be more extensive. If you uh, choose to do a full review at the end of the orientation period, you can do that. And then a matching workflow has to go along with every one of these forms. So maybe a mid-year review form doesn't need, uh, all it needs is a step between a manager and an employee to review it. And then it goes to HR um, to close it down because it's the middle of the year and you're just kind of checking in, seeing how you're doing. Here's the feedback. Here's where I want you to redirect your efforts. I see that you're still lagging and getting this training. You need to make sure you get this done before the end of the year, that kind of feedback. Form closes and they have a reference point. And then when the annual form is sent in the end of the year, then they would um, have a more elaborate form and potentially a more elaborate workflow like I described previously. You need to decide what your rating scales are going to be. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three. ABC. I have my fabulous tale about a company I work for one year that instead of ABC, F was the top score you could get. And that just blew everybody's mind because nobody in their <laughs> whole years of going to elementary and middle schools and high schools ever wanted to get an F. But that was your goal there. I think they just wanted to be different. Um, but you still have to decide, you have to decide what you're going to say for the wording. Is it below expectations? Is it needs improvement, meets expectations, exceeds expectations, above expectations? Um, decide the wording and the number that's associated with that. Goals and objectives, as I noted, there's a multi-tier here. Uh, making those decisions about whether you're going to use all these tiers, whether you're going to um, 
require a certain number of goals from everybody. Uh, another option is oftentimes you can have three personal goals and one training goal. Um, that's sometimes a combination people have. Uh, job competencies by job role, that's more detail as I noted, you'd have to decide. And then um, job role details. So job descriptions, some companies don't have them, don't have them written down. Sometimes they don't share them. Um, and maybe that's because of management trying to be able to manage and, and make it available for everybody. Uh, other government entities we've worked with are required to do it. So they do have that information. Does it mean you have to bring it in to Lantaria? No, not necessarily, but um, if it exists somewhere else. But again, it's a consideration. It's something to think about. And do I need to go and get that data to bring it in here if I want it in here? Job responsibilities, job requirements per the job role, also more detail data that you can make available to those people that are in those roles. When I log into the system, I can go and look at job responsibilities and I can see, or the job description, I can see all of the information about the job and I have a good idea of what's expected of me. And sometimes that's the biggest issue in performance is that employees don't know what you're expecting of them. Um, I didn't know I was supposed to have that skill or that you were asking me to demonstrate it at this level. Uh, and uh, this would give, again, some insight to that and understanding for both the manager and the employee. Work-life balance. So let's talk about absence management and some timesheets. So we have time and attendance in our module, uh, but essentially, What's it all about? It's to provide that consistent absence request process. Uh, right now, maybe you're using, again, Excel, pick on poor Excel, but maybe it's Excel that you're using to keep track of requests. Maybe it's a homegrown application. Maybe it's something in SharePoint with an approval workflow, um, but it sits out that by itself and uh, you wanna make it part of a larger system. Uh, this is what our module can do. Same with the time tracking. We do have timesheet capability where you can track your time against projects that you might be assigned. This is helpful, again, if you're that consultant firm um, or maybe a legal firm, but not everybody makes people do timesheets anymore. And it just depends and varies. Maybe you do it only for your hourly employees or your hourly positions. And then being able to um, report on all of this information, who's on vacation, show everybody across the company who's out of the office. Uh, with the new world we're in, maybe show people who are re working remotely. Um, you can have them classify the type of absence they had. So uh, some companies I work with like to keep track very granularly. They're, jury duty, uh, military service, paternity leave, maternity leave, um, school, you name it, a variety of uh, absence types that you can have, whatever you can dream up, you can put in the system, and then they can pick those. And it isn't necessarily about that they have, for some of those things, they may do have, um, uh, hours or days that are assigned to them and they can't go over those limits. But others might be just for reporting purposes. You want to know how or where all the time was spent. And you don't want just some generic other absence as being the category because somebody might ask you to plot it on a graph and say how many people are out for jury duty on an annual basis, how many people go to military service, uh, that kind of thing. So Again, more information, always the better. But ultimately this model is pretty cut and dry. This is what it does, it's tracking uh, requests to take time for whatever reason. And same with um, tracking your time for where it's been put uh, as you work during the day. So considerations, what's the source of the information? Typically it's the employee manually putting in a request. If they're not capable of doing it, their manager can do it for them and even HR can do it for them. 
everybody has access to be able to see that information, but ultimately it's them just registering the type of request, absent request that they um, need. Um, for defining this component, and that also can be the timesheet. So that's manual input um, by the employee for the time where that they spend it. Um, you'll define some parameters around how they enter the time. And then typically they're just going in every day and putting in uh, whatever the equivalent of the time that they're working, seven hours, eight hours, whatever the total amount would be. Uh, what do you need for this uh, component? So the key piece for us is you have to define what we call absence plans. This can be based on whether you're in a particular country, location, job grade or role, um, or there's just general public. You can make this as complex or not complex as you need. I have some clients that have three or four absence plans, and that's typically by job grade, or it could be by country, but it's typically job grade. It would be like uh, part-time employees, full-time employees, managers, and maybe executives or something to that effect, or two different levels of managers. And the reason that is, is because you are awarding based upon your level, you may earn more days. It just depends. Some companies don't make those distinctions, but typically I still see them do it. You as an employee might get 15 days a year vacation and a director or manager, or some higher tier, maybe they get 20 or 25. So you need two different plans so that it does the calculation and awarding the correct number of days available for you to take time off. But you still have to decide how you're going to approach that. Is it by job grade role? Is it by where they are? I have another client that it's based on uh, it's based on a couple of parameters. It's the country they're in because again they have governance rules. The country dictates how many days they get. The company makes their offer or how many days they offer still has to meet the country rules. So they have to be considerate of a lot of different things. And then they look at seniority and your grade level um, for that role that you're in. So a couple of different things that they look at, but you still have to make these decisions. So remember, that's what we're talking about here is what does the customer have to consider when they're looking at these pieces. Timesheets, uh, projects and related activities. So again, by country, location, job role, you would define. So maybe um, there's a certain project for all the programmers to put their time against. These can be large buckets. They don't have to have a lot of granularity, but they do have to be defined and exist so that they can pick them in the timesheet and then put their time against it. And again, the developers could have one bucket. The support team could have another bucket. Uh, general employee has another bucket, that kind of thing. Or I have seen clients who just track overtime and that's the project and activity for the hourly employees. They get assigned based upon the job role they're in and potentially maybe the location or country they're in. And they will get um, projects and activities that are related to entering overtime because that's what the client needs to send to their finance department. The rest of the time, they're not that interested in knowing where they spend their eight hours a day, but they're interested in anything past that. So again, more decisions to think about. Uh, and here's some of the artifacts, as I talked about. You have to define vacation rules, rules for sick days. If you do sick days, if they're not, and they're like you give just blanket PTO 20 days and you can use it however sick vacation, whatever you want to use it for, um, then you don't need necessarily to use the sick day um, setup. And then other types, so those were the ones, again, jury duty, maternity leave, maternity leave. Um, calculation rules, you get to decide how many days, how does it accrue if you choose to accrue. Um, we also have the ability to just kind of front load all of the days at the beginning of the calendar year. Oftentimes this is what clients do, it's more popular than, than doing actual accruals, but some people still like to accrue. Accrue simply means every month or every two weeks or every day I earn a certain amount of my vacation. And as I work through the year, I earn my time and then I can take that time. 
Uh, you also have special circumstances handling, and that can be, do you allow for overbooking if they've exceeded their time? Do you um, allow for uh, taking time off in lieu of pay? Oftentimes for special circumstances that happens. Are there extra days that are awarded because you hit a certain anniversary? Maybe you, you are a 20 year uh, 20 year employee, you've hit your 20 years, you're going to get an extra day this year, or you get an extra week for the year of your 20th anniversary. Um, you can configure it where that happens one time or going forward after every year past 20, then you get an extra week's vacation. Do you get to carry over time? Uh, how much time do you carry over? Does it expire after say three months? Again, these are all decisions. And whoever the project manager is will help guide you through these decisions when you're filling out the forms, but you want to start to think about some of these things in advance. Uh, again, the more prepared you come, the easier the implementation, the faster it's going to go. And as I noted, oftentimes we, we don't get into these heavy discussions until we're already ready to deploy and they can slow us down um, because Again, they have to have some consideration, may need to have some decisions from folks uh, outside of the project team. For timesheets, the projects, the activities, and again, whether you're doing an assignment by the country or the employee's job role or grade, um, that's all considerations as well. There we go, sorry, roll my screen back. Talent, so recruiting. Again, what does recruiting have to do with? Well, it's going out and finding that talent to bring into the company, either for new positions or to backfill open positions. There really isn't much more to say about that. Some of the things that you can do in this module is uh, manage those vacancies, the candidates that come through and apply, um, provide hiring managers uh, definitely more participation in the selection process. Traditionally, HR teams or talent teams um, control often the whole pro process and, uh, uh, and it isn't until they get down to we'll say three top candidates that they would bring the manager in. We have the ability in our system to allow the manager to see some of the candidates uh, that are elevated prior to that we'll say narrowing down of three, maybe you see 10. And you can give feedback looking at their resume and their responses to some of the key questions and maybe interviews done by HR to date already as like a pre-screen situation. Uh, you can have them look over the data and then give HR some feedback. Who do they wanna call in? Who, who, who interests them the most versus letting HR have control of that. So that's kind of a nice twist. It also puts some of the onus over on someone else um, to pick their team, you know, to, to, to have more participation in that selection. Um, some managers like that, some do not, but you can certainly offer that. And then obviously track interviews, scoring forms of any kind, um, that are related to those interview forms. You can have custom ones or out of the box ones, but uh, you're going to have to make some decisions about consistent language. The big key here for interview forms is consistency. Uh, if I have an open interview form, say just a Word document, and it never has on there a drop down box for me to say, uh, this person fits in well with the company. Uh, this person's a good candidate, but they're not the right one for this role. You know, keep them around or keep them in consideration, uh, just not for this position, or they're just not a good fit. Uh, that's some language that you would, at the end of whatever feedback the interviewer gave you, that's a consistent response. Everybody who does an interview with that candidate would have to pick from those three things to determine whether or not um, this person would move forward. And HR can then look at those forms and have a very consistent language used. If you have open text box, people can say whatever they want. I might word it completely different. Yeah, they're okay, they're nice. I liked them. What does that mean? Are they, are they a good choice and not a good choice? So again, if you don't provide that consistent response then people have a tendency to Eh, veer off course and use whatever language they're comfortable with, but it doesn't 
you can't look at it quickly and say, oh, this is the person we need to move forward. After all the interviews, this is the one that came out on top. And again, some of that is built into the system. Some you can change the language, but that is really the key. You want to have very consistent responses from your interviewers. So the source of the information is approval processes. This can be a request form that comes from your managers when they want to hire for a backfill or a new position. HR or the recruiting team needs details about what jo the job opening should be, what kind of talent it should seek, uh, skill set, any of those details uh, previously might have been a discussion between the hiring team and the manager. And now the manager can be empowered to just fill in a form and that form gets sent along the approval process of what it is that they're seeking. Whether they're requesting an opening or they're just requesting a backfill, you can have the form kind of do double duty and inform whoever it is. And then it can go on an approval process, meaning it can go from a manager to their manager who signs off on it and says, yes, you can begin to start the search. And then it goes on to HR so that they are made aware. And then they start the process of building out the job opening and starting the candidate selection process. Uh, that's a source of information, manual input. They may just generate uh, based upon budget plans, what open positions and then just start hiring at various points or quarters throughout the year. Uh, and then are you going to use an external candidate portal? We provide that as part of our module. Um, I'm sure other solutions do as well. But you can post a job externally, seek candidates through that. Do you want to do that? What does the application form look like? Do you have a current application form or do you just have it where on your company website, you ask people to just send their resumes? Well, now you have the opportunity potentially to ask them a lot of questions. So again, it's consistent responses to narrow down who you're going to select from and you can even potentially build in a question that can be what i call that famous gotcha question meaning if whatever we've set for a parameter do you have 10 years experience in x y and z if they answer no then they sort of get rejected right there on the spot because you really are looking for people who say yes okay and then obviously their supporting documents have to support that truth and uh, if it doesn't then you still have an opportunity to dismiss them later or or consider them later for a different position or maybe a junior position but ultimately are you going to have a standardized application form that everybody would leverage things you need to define here so again some of the uh considerations information you got to go collect job descriptions are going to be really key if you didn't put them in the system but you have them somewhere else you'll leverage them for defining job openings uh, interview form standardization as i just noted thinking about you can have a lot of different interview forms you can have one for hr doing a phone screen they ask very unique questions you can have ones that they ask you know tell me a time when you x y and z and uh, but a manager might have a very short form they might have just strengths weaknesses and then that one question that says good fit move forward not a good fit but keep around and you know or the last one just not a good fit uh, so but again you're getting that consistency from that standardization uh, you can again have multiple levels uh, of that form but i do typically see like an hr screen phone screen interview form and then i'll also see uh maybe a team form that you use if you have team members to answer and then i have a manager the actual hiring manager form uh and then a review process for considered candidates so what's that going to look like um you know do they um, do they go from applied to pre-screen to in progress? You can have people have different statuses as they move along and you start to continually narrow your view for the hire. This also is visible to the manager. They can see as people make their way along the process. But thinking about what is the process? What do you want it to be? How is it going to work? Sometimes people empower managers to kind of take over full 
uh, once the opening is there, created by HR, they take over the scheduling of interviews and the narrowing down of candidates. Others, like the talent manager recruiting or HR departments to retain that, and they do the heavy lifting. So again, if you do it a certain way and you rather do it a different way, here's your chance when you're doing an implementation is to make some of those shifts and decisions. If you're not, you just need to know what the rules are so that they can be replicated over here in the automated system. Some of those artif artif artifacts, I'll get it out, artifacts are, uh, again, job descriptions, uh, and a, a job request approval process, I talked about that, candidate statuses, applied, in progress, job offer, you know, uh, hire offer made, that kind of thing, interview forms, sample emails, these are great. Most of the time, HR has these kinds of things. You just have to collect them so that you have them, again. So they can be provided to your implementation person and they can configure the system to have them. But these are the letters that go back and forth and say, uh, we'd like to bring you in for an interview. Are you available? Blah, blah, blah. These are templates that the team can use and modify before they actually send to the candidate so they can customize and personalize them. But at least they have a starting point. They don't have to rewrite the whole message. Uh, other things are, thanks for your time, we're considering other candidates, I need more information from you or a particular type of sample. I have one client that looks for writing sample for some, like say, marketing jobs. So you might have a different kind of request. The key there is you have these templates and you track the communications that happen between you and the candidate. So if I'm the recruiter and I go on a fabulous vacation to Fiji for a month and somebody's trying to backfill for me, then they can see all of the communications that have already taken place with this person. They're not sitting in just my personal email box. They're part of the candidate record. Sample application form, like I talked about for that external site, and then some uh, details about how you're going to link maybe to that career portal from your company site. What's the way you do it now? If you go to a different vendor or do you do it at all? Or you just have it in there saying, send me your resume. You now can put a link to leverage the career portal that typically is branded with colors and logo related to the company so that it looks like it's part of it and they can apply to any of the opportunities. All right, so I think we're coming up last but not least as we roll into the kind of the last 20 minutes here. Um, new skills. So this is the learning management module. And again, somewhat obvious, but this is where you would manage various types of learning content materials is what we sometimes call them. Uh, from multiple sources that can be documents, it can be videos, they could be in house, they could be on YouTube, they could be uh, on an external vendor site uh, like Skillsoft or Harvard Business School or wherever they might exist. Uh, you can plug them into your learning catalog and people can enroll in them, your employees can enroll and you can track them taking some of these key courses that are requirements for their jobs, nice to haves for their jobs, just betterment. Uh, as an employee types of courses as well. It could be like time management or customer service. That's what our goal is here, is to just offer, again, a single site for you to know what they've taken, what they haven't taken, if they have any certifications that you've issued them and they expire after a certain period of time, do they need to re-up their training? All that data can be captured here in the system. And you, of course, again, can report on that. Uh, each employee would get a grade book. We'll show the courses they've taken. If there's any requirements or expiration date, there were quizzes or tests that were associated, certificates that were issued. All of that gets put pretty much in that learning record. And you are able, managers are able to go in and look at what their employees done. Employees are able to go in and look at what they've done and plan for more training and for you know, growth in the future. Uh, as I noted, you can track and report on those completions, 
Um, you can retire courses off and report on the courses that maybe they're only good for a year, like a compliance or security course might only be good for a year and then they have to take it again. So it's an annual type um, certification. Uh, you also may have to manage courses that are restricted to only certain people being able to take them because there is a cost associated or you just it's not appropriate for some people in the organization you know specifically for accountants and not everybody's an accountant so they don't need to take those courses and they would have to request permission so you can actually do that and define which uh, set of employees it's mandatory for and which ones it would have to be a permission provided course and also you can obviously do in-person events as we start to come back together in the office as well as uh you know that could be a combination a hybrid where it's people in the office as well as people on a zoom call or teams call uh, so you can have a still consider it a in-person event even if they're attending by a zoom you're still taking attendance attendance might be required to earn credit for the course or you can earn hours for the course if you're a professional services firm oftentimes it goes to your certification all of that can be handled in the learning module so source of the information, content developed internally, again, documents. A lot of times HR has a lot of policy documents you need to read when you're a new hire, you can put those in the system. And when the new hire arrives on site, or even if they're not on site, but they start with the company, you can point them or enroll them in courses that they need to take and read uh, that material. And then externally created content. So consider those third party vendors you might purchase um, a lot of courses from like uh, LinkedIn Learning has everything under the sun because lynda.com is who they used to be and they had everything under the sun. So you can get things as um, you can do customer service modules, you can do specific application training, and then you can also learn to play the guitar. They have, again, <laughs> kind of, um, you know, hobbyist type training uh, in there as well. Um, and what do you need to define this component? So you need to build out the learning catalog, that catalog again, manually, or if you integrate with say LinkedIn Learning or the other product we have, which is Go One, you'll get to choose uh, what courses you wanna bring into the catalog and make available to your teams. And that's done through an integration. It's populated as such. Uh, mandatory training process for requesting training if it's um, permission required and uh, handling external training if there's a cost event they want to go to a conference uh, again a lot of this was uh, very viable prior to COVID situation now we're just starting to come back to it but still if i want to go to a conference they're starting to bring those back and if i want to go and there's a cost associated and you can submit a form so somebody can approve it to make sure that you have approval before you go and do the expenditure and then we also have the ability to define categories. You would have to think about what it is that you want to classify the content as company policies. Uh, maybe it's specific uh, technical training. So you can have a category for that. It's company history. It could be whatever you need it to be, but you can define those as well. It's just another way to group the information. And then those artifacts are external training approval process so i just noted categories competency alignments you can link performance competencies so say like negotiation is one of your competencies you can link that to a training course in the system that teaches you about better negotiation skills or uh, leadership roles how to better manage your team or better customer service, uh, time management, you name it, but you can still have that as a competency in the system. And what that does is it allows, uh, say I went through the performance process and my boss says to me, you need more customer service training, go out and look in the learning catalog for courses that are related to customer service. You go to the catalog and you can actually search by the competency customer service. And hopefully there's courses aligned to it that you can enroll in and take that will give you some of the skills. And then that can be fed back into your accomplishments 
for training uh, when you go to the next review cycle for performance. And, and so it's a cyclical, they tie into one another. They're, you know, you're trying to use and leverage each with each other. So again, that employees are empowered to go and find the education they need and also for their accomplishments and how well they do in getting those goals achieved. Uh, you can define quizzes either, again, that can be coming from um, the content that you purchased or you built your own quizzes. You can build out uh, curricula, which is a way of dealing with blended learning, if you've heard that term. That could mean a test and a course and a document and a, a physical demonstration. I have a client where uh, uh, to earn a certificate at uh, their cell phone tower, um, engineers and our technicians and they have to actually demonstrate that they can climb a tower uh, so all of those things uh, they take a test they go they participate in a class um, they read some documentation and then they do a physical test and all of that together is in one curricula it's applied to technicians as they start with the company they're issued a certificate it's good for like two years and then they can report on when it's time for them to re-up and take the training and um, get updated on any of the information and also still prove they can climb the tower so that's how you can use a curricula custom certificates so you can add your own inside the system if you want to create specific ones um, based on specific training that you offer and also feedback <coughs> excuse me feedback <laughs> hang on <laughs> feedback questionnaires uh, sorry about that que feedback questionnaires allow you to after you've taken the training to provide um, your comments back i like the professor i like the trainer um, you know, the course was good, it was bad. Uh, here's how I think it should be improved. You can ask those questions. They can also use standardized um, scoring. So yeah, I give it a four, a 10, whatever you need to. And you can report on that and um, make improvements if you need to, or be happy that you exceeded people's expectations. Um, that's always the goal of feedback. Sorry. <clears throat> All right, so nobody said any of this was going to be easy. So I've talked about a lot of things. And I don't want anybody to ever think that this is that easy. It doesn't have to be hard, but there is heavy lifting involved. You have to make some decisions. You have to understand your organization. You have to know what your goals are when you come to deploy the system. You can't necessarily be passive and let the system dictate to you just because it has functionality in the box you can certainly use it if you want it as a starting point because you don't really know what you want to do and as you start to use it you may change your mind and find that that's the time after you've had some experience with it you'll say oh okay now i i think i understand it and i want to make some changes but also if you do have a lot of processes in place today and you want to bring them across and you want to improve them or make more of them um, here's your opportunity and just be aware of the things that you have to go and collect and or create or decide so some of the lessons learned from our side is standard practices is a big goal here and sometimes in some of our newer um, newer type companies a lot of a software company software based companies uh, standardization is not they, you know they're more about being creative and they may not want some standardization but typically hr teams like standardization because they want consistent approaches to all of their employees so despite what the culture may dictate um, the practices still need to be in place uh, that they can use over and over so think about that when you're working and trying to decide and then understanding your company needs what does the company dictate what do you have to have are you required by law to have anything in particular um, and also what is uh, just overall what it, what is it that your expectations are your executives expectations are for this product 
Not everything should or can be automated um, with SharePoint as the underneath uh, application foundation. Uh, you can with custom development do a lot of stuff, but does that mean you should spend the money on doing that? Maybe not. Sometimes you still just have to go to your email and send somebody an email, or maybe you have to still pick up the telephone. Um, but where you can automate, you certainly should put the process down on paper and then determine where is it? Like, is this a step? Uh, here's a great example. <clears throat> we have the ability, as I said, for onboarding, offboarding processes. A lot of times in the company, all of those tasks are done by HR. Maybe there's a couple done by IT, but maybe a good majority of them are done by HR, just because that's the way it is. Um, HR kind of knows what they have to do. So do they really need an automated process to tell them what to do? Well, maybe, maybe just for tracking purposes, because again, if I go on my one month vacation to Fiji, uh, somebody else may have to pick up for me and maybe they don't know where I was in the process. So they can see what's still left or what's still pending to do for that new person. If um, that's too much, because again, an HR person just kind of knows what they need to do, there's only one of them or maybe two of them, um, you don't need to create an automated process. If it doesn't make sense, again, you don't have to do it. Um, it's just there for you to use it. And maybe you'll use it differently. Maybe you'll use it for the exit survey because that's something that you'd like to get done, but um, you don't want to have it, uh, you know, you don't want to have the overhead of having to do it or you want to have record of it or because somebody wants reporting on why they leave. If they were a good person, they were a good worker, why'd they go? You know, we didn't pay them enough. They didn't like the organization. We relocated them. We didn't challenge them enough. What? Let's hear what they have to say. And then as I noted, preparation is key. That's really what this whole presentation has been about. I want to get you to start to think <clears throat> about the things that you might need to make decisions on, to collect, to have in your hand when you come and you start an implementation project for an HRMS. That's really the key here. And hopefully this has given you some insight. And like I said, in that getting started guide, you have it as a reference. A lot of the same artifacts um, that I have on my slides are pulled right from that uh, guide. So it's there on page. So you can actually check a box whether you have it or don't have it. And you can always add more to the guide itself if you find that you have uh, things that weren't considered. But uh, we're trying to give you some of our experiences in between uh, all of our project managers. Uh, this is some of the things that shook out that on a regular basis either came as a surprise to somebody that they had to go get this data or where would this data come from or I never thought about this. Uh, and again, reduce some of the stress we all know you have other day jobs. And so doing an implementation project like this needs to be uh, made a little bit easier and not quite such a heavy burden uh, while you're still trying to do that other job that you have. So uh, again, preparation can be very key and give you an idea of things that maybe you hadn't thought about. All right, we're right at almost 3.30. I don't know if we have any questions. I'm gonna look in the chat. I think I can see the chat. I don't know if we have anybody in the chat. If you have anything, you can post it to me. If you don't think of it now, you can certainly email me. On the next slide, you'll see my email. And if we don't, I don't see anything in there right now, but Oops, I love when it changes slides for me. Here you go. So you can find me at that email. You can find our company at that URL. And if you need any more information, you can reach out and certainly ask me if you have any questions, concerns. And as I noted, go out and look at our resources guide. There's a lot of PDFs that are out there, not just this one, but it'll talk a little bit more directly to our product. But this one was somewhat generic in terms of, uh, again, the modules that are present in most HRMS systems and some of the items that you would have to go and consider. And I said, create or collect before you start this kind of project. Okay. All right. Well, I thank everybody for their time. I hope you join us again. We'll have another session coming up in the next month.
And I don't know that we've decided on a topic just yet, but I'm hoping you'll come back and join us again. Thanks. Bye.